this is really interesting to me when I began to think about social evolution and its relationship to symbols, because that is a part of our evolutionary history, and religion and social organization. I mean, this is kind of the stuff you heard in school, perhaps you've long forgotten, but actually it's really interesting when you stop and think about it. And so what we really mean now is the various eras of human existence, as in the Paleolithic, the Neolithic, breaking into the Bronze Age, Late Bronze Age, Iron Age, and then sort of bleeding into what we call the Dark Ages, not really so dark. Medieval times, the Renaissance, pre-industrial, industrial society, and post-industrial society. All of those things are are in our unconscious. Uh, that's what I want to get to sort of about what this psychology of the unconscious in Freud and Jung is addressing when it talks about instinctual urges. So we have to learn about the Paleolithic and how that is structured going into the Neolithic and how that is structured and the Iron Bronze and Iron Age and what changed. So let's talk about that. I want you to imagine a valley with hills around like the plains of the Serengeti or some other aspect without a trace of human beings, except now in this landscape of hill and valley in the dry season, there's a road, which is our timeline, just the dirt road. In our fantasy, just to illustrate these different periods of human development, we're going to say that the road is 10 miles long. And where we're standing now, our perspective looking at the road and the valley and the hills is the present, now. And then as we look way, way, way to the horizon where the road fades around the side of the hill, we're going to start there. We're going to call it 75,000 years ago. So this is going to be the late Paleolithic time, 75,000 years ago. When you imagine that, what you get is that from 75,000 years ago to now in the present, 84% of that time was lived in the late Paleolithic era. 84%, which on our time scale would be eight and a half miles of our 10 mile journey is Paleolithic. And when we talk about the different ages, I think it's very helpful. I think of them as actually different lifestyles so that the Paleolithic is the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And in the Paleolithic, human beings lived in the original human situation, which is the band of human beings, hunter-gatherer bands. That is the lifestyle. Now, as we go through the ages, it's also important to remember that each of the lifestyles we're going to encounter in each of the ages still continues to this day. You could say, yes, of course, we still discover human bands living on islands in the jungles with a hunter-gatherer Paleolithic lifestyle. But you could say that aspect of living is still in my life, still in, in your life. We have our band. Uh, we have our bubble, that group of people who is closest to us. And the Paleolithic band is a group of human beings of somewhere between 20 and 50 individuals. I've always called it two families plus hangers-on make a band. 
And we say that because the two families plus the hangers on stragglers that are then accepted into the band create just enough genetic diversity that a band of human beings can continue for hundreds and hundreds of years in a hunter gatherer society. So that's 84%, about eight and a half miles of our journey. Next, we move to the great revolution, which is called the Neolithic Revolution, which is now we're coming into 12,000 years before the present. The Neolithic Revolution is the domestication of plants and animals. I should mention that this concept of the Paleolithic, Neolithic, the lithic part, lithic, <laughs> lith means, of course, stone in Greek. The Stone Age, this concept of the Stone Age goes back to John Lubbock in England. And in 1865, he published a very influential book called Prehistoric Times, in which he talked about the Stone Age, and he invented the terms Paleolithic, Neolithic as the Old Stone Age, New Stone Age. And to talk about the Stone Age means that archaeologically, we're talking about our archaeologists, paleontologists are able to dig up stone artifacts. That's what the Stone Age refers to, stone artifacts, which in this case is essentially flint, because flint was worked into tools that could be used. And then occasionally, the most fantastic stone you could find, which was obsidian, which is essentially volcanic glass. We know that there were extensive trading networks for obsidian, which made better knives, better arrowheads, and that's the Stone Age. And as we start to talk about the change from one age to another, you have to remember that this discovery and adoption of a new lifestyle among human beings is a process. It wasn't that there was a bright line across history and people said, oh, now we're going to live in the Neolithic era. It's a process, and in different places took different amounts of time, but the general date given for the Neolithic revolution of the domestication of animals and plants is 12,000 years ago. About that time, the hunter-gatherer lifestyle changed to the possibility of a more settled existence. So, if we think of Paleolithic people as living in human bands, we think of Neolithic people as living in villages. And that domestication means that if it's plants and crops, it's a village. If it's herding of animals that are domesticated, then it can be a nomadic tribe. It's not exactly a village. So the concept of tribe is by definition a Neolithic concept. A tribe is a conglomeration of bands, and you see that in tribes with the different clans. The clans are the old memory of how bands came together to make larger organizations. And I should say that in my own research, my hypothesis is that I think of each age as having to do with the carrying capacity, as it's called, of the environment, which is essentially how many people can live in the same place at the same time and still have enough food to eat. With a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, you can't have too many people in the same place at the same time because there are not that many berries and there's not that much game for a large group of people. Smaller groups of people, as I said, up 20 to 50 can live within a region and sustain the band by hunting and 
gathering. So the Neolithic Revolution, because you're domesticating plants and growing your own crops, now you have a situation where 200 or so people can live in the same place at the same time. It's an exponential growth from the 20 to 50 of the band, the 200, let's say, to 500 of the village can live in the same place at the same time. So, back to the idea of on our journey, that means that the Neolithic Revolution is only one and a half miles from where we are today compared to our 10 miles. Because really now you have to move to about 5,500 years ago to the next revolution, which is called the Bronze Age Revolution 5,500 years ago in the ancient Near East. In other words, what we call ancient Sumer was the beginning of the first city. And the revolution is essentially metallurgy. We move now from stone tools and implements that archaeologists can find to the first metal, metallurgy, and the secrets of metallurgy. And the lifestyle now shifts population density to the city. The first cities on the face of the planet are dependent on this Bronze Age revolution in which now you have cities in which 10,000 people can live in the same place at the same time. This concept of carrying capacity means that a city is by definition not self-sufficient. The carrying capacity requires the vassal states to send in supplies, food, to resupply the city every five days. The hunter-gatherer band is self-sufficient, a village is self-sufficient, but a city requires a much larger environment to meet its carrying capacity. Until now, we can jump ahead to the Iron Age, 3,200 years ago, and in general, you can think of ancient Rome as being the Iron Age city. And in the Iron Age city, now uh, Rome, the first city of one million people, a megalopolis, as it's called, has a carrying capacity that requires the entire Mediterranean basin to supply the city for one million people to live in the same place at the same time. So back to our timeline, what we have is that the Iron Age at 3,200 years ago is only 4.2% of human time since 75,000 years ago. And on our map, it's hard to start to put on even the birth of the Iron Age because it works out to being 580 yards from here to ancient Rome. And then finally, to come to the Industrial Age, only 250 years ago, we have a hard time even putting that on our map because that is going to represent only one-third of one percent of human history since 75,000 years ago. And on our map, that works out to about six yards, six steps, this industrial age, again, with Megalopolis, the first city of 10 million people, New York, soon followed by London. That requires the entire world trade, industrialized trade, to supply the city. In what I'm trying to say, it's important to remember that each of these different ages, from the Paleolithic to to the Industrial Age, represent a different psychological need. That the tool set you need to live in each of these lifestyles is different and represents a development of the unconscious, 
and those different tools would be an aspect of what Freud calls the superego, and Jung eventually comes to call the cultural unconscious, which is a way of saying how society pressures us to conform.